So today's topic, as you know, uh, I just mentioned, is about the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the greatest of all love. This topic is built off of a single ayah of the Qur'an and a part of an ayah from the Qur'an. This is in Surah Al-Baqarah, ayah number 165. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَشَدُّ حُبًّا لِلَّهِ That those people who claim or profess faith, you know, at the expense of getting a little technical, I want to explain this just for a second. This phrase that commonly repeats itself throughout the Qur'an, whenever Allah calls on us, uh, O oh, you who believe, the translation we're used to hearing. Ya ayyuhal ladina amanu. The word amanu is a verb that signifies something that occurred in the past. It's a past tense verb. And so when it's used in this fashion, in this manner, rhetorically, it has more of the effect of saying, that those people who claim to be believers, those people that who, have, who at some point or time in their life have said that we believe, we are believers. They've claimed iman, they've claimed faith, they've claimed belief at some point or another. And so one thing that's very interesting, the classical Mufassirun of the Qur'an commented on this. They said that wherever Allah says, Ya ayyuhal amanu, it is basically a call on us to back up what we've said. Substantiate it, prove it. You've said that you believe. Now here's your chance to prove it. And that's why, Ya ayyuhaladina amanu, as we read in the prayer, Qulu qawlan sadida, it's followed by a command. And sometimes it's followed by a prohibition. Allah forbidding something. Why? Because prove it. Establish it. Substantiate your claim that you are a believer by following through with this command. So here in this ayah in Surah Al-Baqarah, Allah says, وَالَّذِينَ amanu." That again, those people who claim to be believers, how can they prove their faith and their iman, their belief in Allah? أَشَدُّ حُبَّ لِلَّهِ That they will be very strong. They will be the strongest. أَشَدُّ حُبَّ They will be the strongest when it comes to love for Allah. They will be the strongest in their love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's the mark of a believer. That's the sign of a believer. That is the foundation on which the life of a believer is built upon. Is that his love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, his undeniable, unquestioned, full-fledged devotion and dedication to Allah is his evidence and his proof of the fact that he lives his life based on the primary principle of Allah comes first in his life, or in her life. And so this whole topic is built around this issue. However, at the same time, I don't want to give the standard format that this type of a topic would follow. Where we would go through the ayat and the ahadith that emphasize the importance of loving Allah. Rather, what I'd like to do is kind of switch gears real quickly and talk about our situation today. When we look around the world today, and I'm talking about Muslim and non-Muslim alike, even particularly within the Muslim community, within circles of people who claim faith, iman, belief, iman, we see frustration, we see anxiety, we see sadness, we see, you know, Difficult, a range of different emotions. We see a lot of emotional, spiritual adversity, difficulty that people are experiencing across the board. To the point where that has become the, the, the standard emotional state of people. The standard emotional state, the typical outlook on life is one that is very pessimistic, is one that is very frustrated. Normally speaking, people today, their normal mode of behavior is frustration. It's anger. It's sadness. Deprivation. That is the normal state in the condition of people today, spiritually and emotionally. To the point where any time that we feel good, we feel content, we feel fulfilled, that is a departure from our normal state. That is, that's the high point of our, of our you know, human experience. 
when we actually feel like, you know, I'm actually having a good day today. And that's the highlight of a person's week or a person's month or a person's year. And when we take a look at that, when we understand that, we can trace that directly back to the same issue. Why is there such an empty feeling that is so prevalent today? And to be very, very straightforward and open about the topic, to not beat around the bush. How is it possible that people who pray five times a day, people who fast occasionally, people who recite Quran on a daily or you know, every other day basis, how is it possible that people who are practicing are still struggling? are still frustrated, are still feeling empty. How is that possible? I've had so many people come up to me just within the last few weeks. Because whenever you go somewhere, you go to talk or you teach a class somewhere, people like to come and ask questions. And I always get caught, I, I literally get caught off guard every single time by this question. Where somebody will come up to me and say, I'm praying five times a day, I'm doing this, I'm doing that, but I feel empty. And it's, it's a real predicament. Because if somebody came up to me and said, I feel empty, I said, well, you need a lie in your life. But how is it possible that somebody is praying five times a day and still has this empty, frustrated, de deprived, emotional condition and state? How is that possible? How do you reconcile the two? And we realize, because at the end of the day, we have to understand that the objective the point of our existence, the objective and the purpose of Iman, Islam, that we try to live, the objective of the worship, the ibadah that we engage in, is all to become close to Allah and attain the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's the objective here. So, again, at the expense of sounding too simplistic, this is the solution to everyone's problems. The love of Allah is the solution to everyone's problems. Every single problem, the solution to it can be found here. And will be built off of this primary principle, and that is love for Allah. There's a, a remarkable, beautiful story that the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam relates to us where the Prophet paints like a picture, he describes a scenario. This is the eloquence of the Prophet and what a remarkable teacher he was. So he paints a picture, he says, imagine somebody traveling through the desert on a camel, and they got all their provisions tied onto that camel. And again, to contextualize what that exactly means, you know, imagine that you're driving through central Texas. All right? Central Texas, by the way, I think, right? Texas Chainsaw Massacre. <laughs> kind of a scary place, okay? We got, we got to put some context to it. Because traveling through the desert by yourself is a scary notion. Right? Driving from Austin to Houston is not scary. All right? Depending on who the driver is. All right? <laughs> but typically, the journey itself is not scary. It's not life-threatening. Yeah. So imagine you're driving through Central Texas. Texas Chainsaw Massacre. And you're kind of freaked out. And you're driving by yourself. And you're driving in your Honda Civic that has different colored doors. <laughs> you understand what that means? The Honda Civic that you actually can have a conversation with as you drive. Because of all the different sounds that it makes. You can practically hold a conversation with your car. Alright? So you're driving in a beat up old car, middle of the night, by yourself. Through the middle of nowhere. Scary, frightening looking place. And just the, the prospect of that, just, just, the, just what is possible, what could go wrong there? It, there's a lot that could go wrong. It could be very, I mean, it, it could be really scary. And a lot of you young men, if you try to take, undertake a journey, you're going to probably will let you. Right? Because of what could go wrong, you could turn really bad very quickly. So the Prophet says in the same fashion, somebody's traveling through the middle of the desert, crossing through the middle of the desert, hundreds of miles, 
by himself, riding the camel. He's got the transportation. But everything that he needs is on that camel. Everything I need is in the back seat of the car. And he stops somewhere to get some rest, ties up his camel, maybe lays down, you know, get some rest or do something, use the restroom, whatever the case may be. And he comes back and his camel's gone. So imagine you stop at a really shady location, you know, rest area or truck stop, right? Where you're almost certain like a couple of serial killers probably operate out of here. Really frightening, scary looking. But you gotta use the restroom, what are you gonna do? So some way, somehow you muster up the courage, you park your car directly under a light, you lock your car, you go inside, looking back over your shoulder, cell phone in hand, Right? And you go inside, and you go use the restroom, and you come back out, and your car's gone. Just imagine the panic that would set in at that moment. How frightened you would be. Let's just say you didn't even have your cell phone, it was in the car. And the car's gone. Imagine how scared and terrified. Your wallet was in the car, your cell phone was in the car, because you're a genius, mashallah. So everything that you have, that could possibly be your backup plan. Everything was in the car. And the car is gone. Nowhere to be seen. Just imagine the, the hopelessness, the, 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 the anxiety that would set in at that moment. You'd freak out. So this man, his camel is gone. And he's terrified. And after the initial, like, just running around looking, then it, the, the, he feels scared. Then eventually reality starts to settle in that I'm pretty much dead. I'm not gonna make it out of this alive. I'm not gonna survive this. And it eventually manifests in just giving up. The guy just gives up, surrenders. And he goes and he lies down under a tree and he just waits for death to overtake him. There's no point here. In the middle of the desert, hundreds of miles around, there's nothing. No water, no food, no sustenance, no human being, no means of communication, nothing. And this is the desert. You're not going to make it on foot. So what do you do now? And so he just lays down, not knowing what to do, what to think, and just figure, whatever. And he closes his eyes, and then maybe dozes off, or just lays there with his eyes closed for a little while, wakes up after a little while, opens his eyes, and lo and behold, what's standing right next to him? It's his camel. Just chilling, standing next to him. And he can't even believe what he's looking at for a second. For a moment, he thinks he's dreaming or he's already dead. Like, am I dead? Is this heaven? Why is there a camel in heaven, right? So he, he doesn't know what to think for a moment. And he sees his camel, and he jumps up and grabs the camel, and it's the camel. It's there. And then he checks the back seat, and all his stuff is there. His wallet's there, his phone is there, his water is there, his food is there. Everything's there. And at that moment, in that height of emotion and excitement, he screams out, Allahumma anta abdi wa ana rabbuk. <laughs> oh Allah, you are my slave and I am your Lord. And the Prophet ﷺ says, Akhta'a bishidbat al farq. He messed up, that was a slip of the tongue. But why did he mess up, mess up? Why did he have that slip of the tongue? Because of how excited he was. How overcome with emotion he was. He was so out of his mind, excited and happy and grateful and thankful that he didn't even realize the words that were coming out of his mouth. He tripped up over his own words. What he meant to say was, Oh Allah, you are my Lord and I am your slave. But think about how excited he was that he didn't even realize what he was saying. He was tripping over his own words. Just try to imagine for a second picture in your head how excited that guy would be. Literally jumping up and down, screaming, just yelling that into the sky. Oh Allah, you are my slave and I am your Lord. Just imagine, get that image and picture in your head. And then the Prophet ﷺ gives us the catch. 
the lesson in all of this, this whole story, the lesson, the moral of the story is, the Prophet of Allah sallallahu says, لَاللَّهُ أَشَدُّ فَرْحَةً بِتَوْبَةِ عَبْدِهِ That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is even more overjoyed. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is even more pleased and more excited and more happy when a single slave of Allah, man or woman, young or old, when one single slave of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala turns back to Allah, re-establishes their connection with Allah, realizes that the love of Allah is more important to that person than everything else and anything else in this world, Allah is more excited, more overjoyed, more pleased, more happy than that man is when he found his camel. Than, that, than you would be when you found your car parked around the other side of the gas station. <laughs> Apparently somebody stole your car and realized stealing this car was more trouble than it was worth. Right? And so they just parked the car on the other side of the parking lot and took off. And you're just walking around in your hopelessness and you see your car and you run in there and everything is still in your car. And imagine how excited you'd be. You'd be jumping up and down, screaming and yelling. May Allah forgive us, we wouldn't even remember to say Alhamdulillah. You see what I'm saying about the overexcitement? We wouldn't even remember to say Alhamdulillah. We would just be fist pumping. Yeah. Do a little dance around the car. Right? We Just so overjoyed. Don't even realize what you're doing. You'd be celebrating for a good five minutes before you found out that you actually have an audience. There's like a bunch of people standing there looking at you very worried about their own safety now. But think about how excited you would be in that moment and then think for a moment, try to picture, try to imagine, try to grasp the reality that when any single human being, any one of us, decides, makes up our mind, and makes a conscious choice and decision in our life that Allah is my number one priority and having a relationship with Allah is more important to me than everything else and anything else in this world, that Allah is more overjoyed than I am at that moment. And that's what we're talking about here. That's the reality. So the love of Allah, we all know why we need it. We all know how important it is. It's the foundation of our faith. It is the essence of belief in the Iman. Make no mistake about that. There are technicalities to our religion. There are issues of faith and theology and aqidah and all of those things. But there is one thing that everything else is built upon and that is a love for Allah. If you know all the technicalities in the world, if you know all the technicalities of the world, you know everything there is to know about the religion, but you lack that love for Allah, then everything is in vain. Because you see, every sense, every faculty, every organ, every part of our body that Allah has given us has a function. The eyes see, the ears, they listen, they hear, the tongue speaks, the mouth speaks, the brain processes and computes and thinks. Everything has a function. And loving is a function of the heart. So if you have all the knowledge of the religion, and we have such an emphasis on knowledge these days. And knowledge is important, don't get me wrong. I've spent half my life studying and I continue to study and then teach a little bit on the side. That's, I'm an educator, that's what I do. I'm a student and an educator. I understand how important knowledge is. I'm not here to diminish the importance of knowledge. But th there is a reality check we all need. That we have a ton of knowledge. Without love, love is the action of the heart. Love is that which penetrates the heart. Love, it lives and exists within the heart. And it emanates from the heart. If there is no love for Allah, no love for Allah's Messenger, and there's just a lot of knowledge of the religion, it is all a bunch of knowledge, books, information that is stacked on the surface but nothing is penetrating through. And the Quranic example of that is what? Surah al Jumu'ah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us it is the example of a donkey that is carrying books. And that's why when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us the example of what iman, what faith, what belief is, Allah gave us the example of 
Surah number 14, Surah Ibrahim, the example of a tree. Kashadaratin, Taibibatin, Asluha Thabit, Wa Faruha Fasam. It is like a beautiful, magnificent tree whose roots are very deep and very firm and strong. And then its branches are very high up in the sky. When you put a seed into the ground, you don't put a seed on top of the ground. You plant the seed inside. You gotta turn the soil. You gotta plant the seed inside. Then you water it. And it gets sunshine. Then it gets water. And then it sprouts open inside of the ground. It sprouts open first inside of the ground. And it begins to grow inside of the ground. And after it has become firm, it is strong, it is stable, it is healthy. Then finally, after a certain amount of growth, it actually sprouts out of the ground and then it's, a, it's, a, it's out there for everyone to see and for everyone to appreciate. But if that foundation, that roots, though that strength, that health was not there under the ground, internally inside, there would be nothing on the outside for everyone to see and appreciate. And that's what we have to understand is the reality of our own faith and our own iman. It is the love of Allah in the heart. The love of Allah and His Messenger Salah that is in the heart. And it grows in the heart and it fills the heart. That's why even the word for love in the Arabic language is hub. Hub. And one of the, there, there are a lot of different opinions that the linguists, the lexicons have about what is the, what, what, what is the root of the word or how did this word develop the meaning of love. But one of the first and most prominent positions of the scholars of the Arabic language is that it refers to uh, al-habba, like a seed. And the reason why the Arabs gave it that name was because they said that when you have like little things, you have uh, what we would call like debris, or seeds, or little things. And if, if you put a few seeds, or a few flakes, inside of a glass, and then you fill that glass with water, what happens to those flakes? What do they do? They rise up to the top. And so the scholars said that love is called hub. Because when it fills up into the heart, it raises. The love continues to rise up to the surface. And it fills up the heart. To the point, until the extent where eventually that love fills up into the heart. To the point where now it rises to the top and it overflows out into a person's actions, in a person's words, in a person's decisions, in a person's choices, and the way they live their life. And so that's what we have to understand. Our foundation is the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's what we need. That's what we require for a healthy iman. Now that we understand it's important, obviously, and we understand it's reality, and we understand why it's necessary, let's talk a little bit about, you know, the nature of love and how love develops and what the essence of this emotion or this experience is is. So, there's a few things to take into consideration. First and foremost is that, we, like we talked about, love is a, an action of the heart. It is an internal experience of the heart. And that's why it relates to the emotional and spiritual capacity of a human being. But then we talk about what is the object of love. What is the object of a person's love? So there are two things. There are two reasons why someone loves something or someone else. Number one is either because of the essence of that, who that person is or what that thing is, or because of the qualities of that person or that thing. And what we have to understand when we talk about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most supreme and Allah is greater than anything and everything in his essence, in his that, and also in his sifat, also in his attributes and his quality. There is nothing superior to Allah. You know, there, there, there's a very, there's a very, you know, there's a reality. There's a reality to life. And that reality is familiarity, becoming familiar with something, knowing something or someone. Becoming familiar with someone leads to 
admiration. You begin to admire that person. You have positive, good sentiments towards that person. But that begins with familiarity. You gotta get to know someone, you gotta know who someone is in order to admire them. That admiration continues to build and that admiration leads to respect. And eventually you get to a point where you respect someone. You respect someone. What you've gotten to know about them, what you've come to admire about them, leads you to respect them. And then when you begin to respect someone, and that continues, that relationship continues to build off of respect, that eventually leads to loving someone. That is the process. And anybody who's had any type of a human relationship knows that to be true. You know someone, you admire someone, you begin to respect someone, and eventually you begin to love someone. When we talk about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what we have to understand, I said Allah is superior in His essence and in His qualities than anything and everything. But the problem is right now we don't even know that. The first step of our journey in order to build and develop love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is to first get to know who Allah is. To understand who Allah is. We don't even know right now. That's the problem. And in order to get to know who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, the most basic step in that regard, read the book of Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala introduces Himself to us in the Qur'an time and time again. Over and over again. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us about Himself. And told us who exactly who He is. What has Allah told us about Him? There's nothing like Him. There's no one like Him. He's superior to everything and everything, anything. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alamin. He is the creator, master, sustainer, provider, protector of all people whenever and wherever they exist. Khaliqu kulli shay. He is the creator of each and every single thing. Not only did he create each and every single thing, but then he taught that thing on how to live its life, how to exist. He gave it guidance, he taught it on how to live, how to exist. He overlooks and supervises and maintains everything. He is Razak, he is the one who feeds and sustains everything and everyone. He is Rahman. He is so merciful that His mercy has no limitations. He is Rahim. He is so merciful that He is constantly merciful without ever suffering any type of a lapse in His mercy. His mercy is continuous, non-stop. Wadud. He is loving. Unconditionally loving. Unconditionally loving. When the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu wanted us to understand the love that Allah has for us, when He wanted us to understand that, the mercy that He has on us, the love that He has for us, the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu pointed to a mother holding an infant. A mother loves her child regardless. But especially when that child is an infant. Think about that stage. How protective a mother is. How nervous a mother is about the well-being of that child. All the time, non-stop. Allah, the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi pointed to a mother holding her infant and said, can you ever imagine this mother doing, harming her child in any way, shape, or form? And the Sahaba radiallahu anhu said, no, Messenger of Allah. The love, the mercy of a mother is a match, unparalleled. And then once the Prophet ﷺ got them thinking, then he said that the mercy that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has upon his slaves is greater than the mercy that a mother has upon her baby. That is the love, that is the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is ghafoor. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us three different attributes for himself when it comes to forgiveness in the Quran. He tells us he is ghafir, immediately forgiven, instantly forgiven. If we mess up, then we immediately turn to Allah and say, I messed up, Allah. I'm sorry, I messed up, Ya Allah. 
instantly forgiven. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, He is ghafoor. He's constantly forgiven. Always, non-stop, constantly forgiven. And then He tells us that He is ghafar. He's abundantly forgiven. So it doesn't matter how much somebody's done, if they turn back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He forgives them. Without any consideration about how much they've done or how many sins they've committed, they sincerely turn back and want to repair their relationship with Allah. This is established in a hadith Qudsi, in a sacred tradition, where the Prophet ﷺ tells us that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Ya Abdi, O oh my slave. And this is an individual address. So Allah is speaking to each and every single one of us individually. Law balagat sama. That if your sins were to reach the limits of the sky, that if one person sinned so much, so much, so much, on their own, by themselves, that their sins stacked up all the way to the sky, north, south, east, and west, covered the entire earth, and then started stacking on top of that and filled up the entire world, all over the earth, all the way reaching up to the sky, as far as the human eye can see into the sky. Think about how many sins that would be. Like every single time I committed a sin, a bottle would appear. And then I kept sinning and bottles just kept appearing to the point where the entire earth became covered with a layer of bottles. And then I kept sinning and they began stacking on top of each other. To the point where they stacked up all the way to the sky as far as I could be, I can see. <laughs> and then the Prophet of Allah and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, ثُمَّ اسْتَغْفَرْتَنِ and then after doing all of these sins, you ask me for forgiveness once. Sincerely, honestly, truthfully. You beg and you ask me for forgiveness. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, غَفَرْتُ لَكَ I have forgiven you. Guaranteed forgiveness. I have forgiven you. وَلَا أُبَالِ And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and no big deal, don't worry about it. I have forgiven you and it's not even a big deal. I won't mind. Because you came back to me. Because we went back to Allah. There's an unbelievable ayah of the Quran. When you appreciate the grammatical, the linguistic nuance of that ayah, it's enough to change your life. It's in surah number 42, surah to shura. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is speaking about himself. He says, وَهُوَ الَّذِي And he alone is the one. Yaqbalu tawbata an ibadihi. Yaqbalu is the present slash future tense verb, mudari. The implication of using this type of a verb is that it's a continuous action, it's a renewing action. It's an action that repeats itself. He is the one that continues to accept. And the word yaqbal comes from qubul. In the Arabic language, it means to receive, to very graciously accept and receive. He is the one that graciously, benevolently, mercifully, he receives and accepts a tawbata, repentance, an ibadihi from his slaves. That we're not done. Not only did somebody mess up and now they're saying sorry and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is accepting their apology, but then he says as proof and to give something more. Not only does Allah accept the apology, So imagine you owe somebody money and you told them you would pay them back on Friday. And we're sitting here on Saturday right now. And you see that brother in the masjid. And you walk up to that brother and you say, Brother, I'm very, very sorry. My bad, I messed up. What, what would you think of the person who would say, No problem, don't worry about it. I'm not upset, I'm not angry. No, no worries. It's all good. What would, you, what would you say about that person? Man, what a great guy. What a great guy, what a wonderful human being. What a remarkable Muslim. He wasn't offended, he wasn't angry, he wasn't upset with me. But then imagine, not only does he say, no problem, don't worry about it, it's all good. I'm, not, I'm not angry, I'm not upset. And then he goes a step further and he says, and you know, by the way, we're, we're straight, we're good, we're clear. Account's clear, don't worry about it. No, no, no. Don't worry about it. I'm telling you. It's all good. It's 
a gift. It's all good. We're good. Just think about how you would feel about that person. You'd go home and make dua for that person. Before you go to bed at night, when you make dua for yourself and your family and your kids and your parents, at that time, that intimate moment where you make dua for the things that are most important to you, you'd make dua for that person. Because you've never met a more gracious human being in your entire life. I mean, the reviews you would give this person. That person has the akhlaq of Rasulullah That's a believer. That's a Muslim. Just how impressed you would be with that person. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, He continues to accept repentance from His slaves. Continues to. Graciously accept it. Okay, no problem. Don't worry about it. But then Allah goes just like further. And he continues to remove, to wipe away, to clear their debts. As sayyat are the sins, the bad things that they've done. Allah says he continues to wipe away their sins. He continues to clear their debts. And here comes the most remarkable part of the ayah. This wow, waya alahum atafanu. This wow in the Arabic language. Normally, everybody, what does wow mean, everybody? And. And. The wow means and. This wow here does not mean and. This wow is what we call wow haliya. I would ask Zayn, but he probably does not. I'll show you. All right. So that this wow is called wow haliya. What it means is even though. While at the same time. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say, وَيَا عَلَمُوا مَا تَفْعَلُونَ While knowing, while full, fully knowing, مَا تَفْعَلُونَ What you will go on to do. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues to accept our apology. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues to wipe away our sins. Even though, while fully knowing, what we're going to do tomorrow, that we're going to make a mistake again tomorrow, that we're going to sin again tomorrow, that we're going to miss another prayer again tomorrow. Not intentionally, but we're going to end up messing up. In spite of that fact, He continues to accept our apologies. He continues to accept our tawbah and He continues to clear our records and wipe, so, wipe away our sins even though He knows, fully knowing the fact that we're going to continue to make mistakes. This is who Allah is. When you get to know Allah, when you learn about Allah, when you get to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then you continue to grow in your love for Him. And so that familiarity leads to admiration. That admiration builds to respect. And you begin to learn and realize more and more about Allah. How powerful is Allah? How remarkable is Allah? How unmatched and supreme is Allah? I mean, the stories are literally endless. The stories are literally endless. One time the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa مَرَّ بِعْرَابِهِ وَهُوَ يَدْعُ فِي صَلَاتِهِ The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa passed by a Bedouin man and he was making dua in his prayer. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa stopped to listen. فَوَقَفَ النَّبِيُّ sallallahu alayhi wa sallam وَسَلْمِعَ إِلَيْهِ The Prophet stopped and started to listen. Started listening to him. And he heard the man calling out to Allah, praising Allah, glorifying Allah. You see, the, you can feel the love of Allah in his words. He was saying, Ya Allah ta'ahu yu'yun. Oh, the one who eyes cannot see in this world. Wala tukhalituhu dhunun. Minds cannot comprehend his greatness. Wala yasifuhu yasifun. People cannot praise him as he deserves to be praised. Wala tukhayyuhu al-hawadith. Situations, incidents, do not change him. وَلَا يَخْشَ الدَّوَائِرِ He does not fear the passing of time. يَعْلَمُ مَثَاقِلَ الْجِبَالِ Allah is the one, He knows the weight of all the mountains in this world. وَمَكَائِلَ الْبِحَارِ He knows the volume of all the oceans in this world. وَعَدَلَ قَطْرِ الْأَمْطَارِ He knows the exact number of drops of rain that fall from the sky. 
He knows the exact number of leaves on all the trees of the entire world. And he knows the full detail of everything that the night hides in its darkness or the day may illuminate with its light. وَلَا تُوَارِي مِنْهُمْ سَمَاءٌ سَمَاءٌ One sky cannot shield another sky from Allah. وَلَا أَرْضٌ أَرْضًا One ground cannot shield another ground from Allah. وَلَا جَبَلٌ مَا فِي وَعْرِي And a mountain in its deepest, darkest caves cannot hide anything from Allah. وَلَا بَحْرٌ مَا فِي قَعْرِي And the ocean in its depths and darkness cannot hide anything from Allah. And later on, it's a lot lengthier narration, but the Prophet eventually calls this man, gives him a gift and congratulates him, لِحُسْنِ ثَنَائِكَ عَلَى اللَّهِ Because of how beautifully you were praising Allah, you understand Allah. You know who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. You recognize Allah, you have the love of Allah. And that's what we need to do. We need to learn, we need to read, we need to embrace. We need to interact with the words of Allah. Learn about who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so we can continue to grow in our love, in our admiration, in our respect for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, to talk about things that we can specifically do to build and increase in our love for Allah. So first and foremost, like I said, just get to know more about who Allah is. And the two things I would recommend for that, number one is read the book of Allah, read the Quran. The second thing that I would recommend is specifically study the names and the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Learn what they mean. Learn who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. See how Allah speaks about Himself in the Quran. That's the first step. Number two, closely tied to the first step. The first step is more about just familiarizing yourself with Allah and understanding. But the second part of it is, is dhikr and remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then taking what you've learned about Allah, the Quran, the names of Allah, dhikr, tasbihat, subhanallah. Do we know, even know what subhanallah means? Glory be to God. What does that mean? You let me know the next time you talk like that. Subhanallah. Subhanallah means how absolutely, un- how remarkably and absolutely perfect and flawless is Allah. How absolutely perfect is Allah. Not a single shortcoming. Subhanallah. Alhamdulillah. The ultimate praise was, is, and will always be for Allah. Everything praises Allah. And Allah deserves praise for everything that there may be. La ilaha illallah. There's absolutely nothing, no one, that is worthy of our devotion, dedication, veneration, worship. Other than Allah. Allahu Akbar. And Allah is greater than anything and everything. No matter what it is that might catch our fancy, no matter what it is that might become a priority in our lives, we remind ourselves by saying Allahu Akbar that Allah is more important than that thing, whatever it may be. Subhanallah, Alhamdulillah, La ilaha Allah, Allahu Akbar. Remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So engage in the frequent dhikr and remembrance of Allah. It's a reality of life, folks. It's a reality of life. The more you talk about something, the more you... You know, uh, Imam Ghazali rahimahullah ta'ala said that when the tongue says something a thousand times, it stands to heart once. When the tongue says something a thousand times, it stands to heart once. The more you talk about something, the more you believe in it, the more you grow in your love and your admiration and respect and affection for it. So talk about Allah. Remember Allah. The third thing is, and this is another reality, when, when you love something, when you love something, you either emulate it, you know they say uh, imitation is the greatest form of flattery, you either emulate it, you imitate it, or you obey it. Whatever that entity may be that you love, you do what it tells you to do. You do what he or she tells you to do. Or you try to be like them. You do what they're telling you to do through their actions or through their words. The obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is very ironic. Because it's, it's a cycle, it feeds into one another. On one side, 
our obedience to Allah is based off of the love we have for Allah. But our love for Allah will depend on how obedient we are to Allah. And that's why the scholars talked about this, that sometimes when maybe you are still growing and developing your love for Allah, and you realize Allah has asked you to do something and you know you should be obeying Him, pray five times a day. You know you should be praying five times a day. But you're still developing your love for Allah. You're still weak in your love for Allah. And that's why praying five times a day is kind of hard for you. You struggle with it. It's a challenge for you. Force yourself to do it. And just the fact that you are obeying and you are doing this. Even though it's difficult, because at the end of the day, you're only doing it for one reason. You're doing it because Allah asked you to do it. That will also help you build your love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So obey Allah. The fourth thing, and this is a huge reality in the, in, in the social context that we're in. Whenever you love something, you display your affiliation or affection for that thing. I'll talk about my own, like something that I can relate to. Something that I would struggle with. So, just I guess by virtue of being from Texas, you know, you're into football. All right, so football is kind of a big thing. So you're, you're into football. So what ends up happening, born and raised in Dallas, Texas, you're a Cowboys fan, all right? Even though this is Houston, nobody cares about your team, okay? All right, so, so you're a Cowboys fan. Now, that's just how you're programmed. I got off the plane today, I was wearing a Dallas Mavericks t-shirt, you know, all right? So it, it's, it's a thing. Now when you love something, you display, you put out there, you display your affiliation. That's something we do, whether it be a brand, or it be an athlete, or it be a sports team, or whatever the case may be, it be a band, whatever the case may be, you display your affiliation, your affection for that thing, for the object of your love, your admiration, your respect, your affection, you display your affiliation to it. We also need to learn to display our affiliation and our affection for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that again is done by the obedience of Allah. Worshipping Allah, primarily the worship of Allah. Praying five times a day, fasting in the month of Ramadan. Staying away from what Allah has prohibited is our display of affiliation to Allah's command. And some parts of it are personal, some parts of it are internal, some parts of it will be public. When you stop to pray five times a day, no matter what the place or the situation is, because I gotta do what I gotta do, this is who I am, this is my affiliation. When the sister walks around with the hijab on, that's her affiliation. That is her displaying the fact that she has a relationship with Allah. And so we have to also realize that and practice that. Understanding that this is, not only is this a display of our love for Allah, but this will help us continue to build in our love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And finally, I'll end with three things that we have to keep in mind. Three things we have to keep in mind as we continue to build and grow in our love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number one is obviously build your relationship with Allah and the absolute foundation of that is your five daily prayers. There is no getting around that. There is no beating around the bush about that. But we gotta get our five daily prayers on track and build our relationship with Allah. In a hadith Qudsi, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself says, وَمَا that he says, وَمَا تَقَرَّبَ إِلَيَّ عَبْدِي بِشَيْءٍ أَحَبُّ إِلَيَّ بِمَّا إِفْتَرَضُّ عَلَيْهِ that there is nothing that my slave comes closer to me. There is nothing that brings my slave closer to me than that which I have obligated upon him, which I have commanded him to do. And that is the five daily prayers. The second thing that Allah tells us about in the Quran, <coughs> that if we want to have the love of Allah, we want to be beloved by Allah, we want to, yuhibbunahum, that uh, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Qur'an in describing believers, He said, يُحِبُّونَ um, يُحِبُّونَهُ uh, I'm trying to remember the ayah, excuse me. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَسَوْفِيَ أَتْنَاكْ بِقَوْمٍ يُحِبُّهُمْ 
وَيُحِبُّونَهُ يُحِبُّهُمْ وَيُحِبُّونَهُ Allah will love them and they will love Allah. If we want to reach that point in our relationship with Allah, where Allah loves us and we love Him, number one, establishing the five daily prayers. And then going forward from there. Once you establish your five daily prayers, continue to grow in that. And my slave continues to keep coming closer to me through the extra prayers. The extra worship that he or she is willing to do until I love that slave. I love him or I love her, Allah says. And then the Prophet, the Prophet of Allah tells us that in another hadith Qudsi, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala nada Jibreel, the pro, uh, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls to Jibreel alayhi salam. And he says that I love so and so. Uhibbu fulalan. I love so and so. So you also love him or love her. And then Jibreel alayhi salam goes to Ahlus Sama, goes to the inhabitants of the heavens, goes to all the angels, says, Allah loves so and so. I love that person as well. You love that person as well. And then that message is brought down to Ahlul Ard, all of the earth, all the creation of Allah. The ahadith mentioned from the ants in their ant holes, ant hills. From the ants in their ant hills to the fishes in the sea and the ocean. That the announcements made to every creation of Allah that exists on the earth, that Allah loves so and so, Jibreel loves so and so, the angels and the malaika love this person as well, and all of you are commanded to love this person as well. Allah has put the love of that person into your hearts as well, and all of their creation loves that person. When the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, who is the beloved of Allah, when he came back to Mecca at the time of Fajr Mecca, at the time of the conquest of Mecca, the Prophet ﷺ was walking around Mecca, he passed by a rock and he goes, I remember that rock. I remember that rock. What would make you remember a rock? You know what would make you remember a rock? He says, I remember that rock, that even before I was given divine revelation, even before the day in the cave of Hira, when Iqra came down, I remember walking by this rock and this rock would say salam to me every single time I walked by this rock. This rock would say salam to me. And I would say, that's interesting. <laughs> and I would keep going. And when divine revelation came, then I understood. We say that the Messenger of Allah is the beloved of Allah, Habib. Habibu Rabbil Alameen. He is the beloved of Allah, but that makes him the beloved of all of Allah's creation. Trees move from their place to come and give salam to the Prophet Animals would come and lower their head in front of the Prophet so that he would pet them and rub his hand on their head. He would show affection to them. All of the creation loves this person then, when that person is loved by Allah. So the first thing we gotta do is we gotta get our relationship with Allah on track by praying to Allah and doing the worship and the ibadah that He has commanded us, obligated us to do. Think of it in this term, in these terms. Allah has asked us to do this. He's asked us to pray. After everything He's given to us, everything He continues to do for us, He asks us to pray. Am I really gonna say no? Am I really going to turn it down? Then the second step of building this relationship with Allah is mentioned in the Quran in Surah Al Imran, where Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, "Qul in kuntum tuhibun Allah, fatabi'uni yuhibukum Allah, wa yafil lakum dhuubakum Allah wa furuh." That announce, say. The Prophet is being told to proclaim this message to the people. In kuntum tuhibun Allah, that if you claim to love Allah, fatabi'uni, then follow my example. And what's interesting about the word itiba', tabi'a means to follow. Itaba'a, itiba' means to closely follow, mashallah. First time he's ever gotten a question right. Alright? So tabi'a means to follow. Ittiba means to closely follow. Precisely. So Allah is saying, if you claim to love Allah, then closely follow the Prophet of Allah, and Allah will love you. Yuhbirkumullah. 
Allah will love you. He will forgive your sins. Because you forgive the person you love. You don't hold grudges, you don't hold things against the person that you love. We gotta learn to be like the Prophet of Allah And after we build, we establish our relationship with Allah, we're getting our relationship with Allah on track through the worship of Allah. The part about being like the Messenger of Allah, this, that specifically highlights how we interact with the creation of Allah. Because the most, the most amazing thing about the Prophet of Allah is what Allah said is the most amazing thing about him. وَإِنَّكَ لَعَلَىٰ خُلُقٍ عَظِيمٍ was his unbelievable character, his dignified, noble conduct, his impeccable manners. That was the most remarkable thing about the Prophet of Allah And we have, to, we have to implement that. That is what will make us closer to the example of the Prophet and that is exactly what will make us the beloved of Allah. Is to be like the Prophet Treat how we treat others. How do we treat the creation of Allah? How do we interact with people? How do we deal with people? And that begins first and foremost in our own immediate vicinity. With the people that are closest to us. The people that are the easiest to take for granted. Those are our family members. It begins at home. You know, the saying, I forgot where, where it comes from, but charity starts at home. Charity begins at home. Akhlaq begins at home. We, are a, we, we, we have a very, very unfortunate uh, contradiction that is very prevalent in our communities today. That first and foremost, we actually have the concept. We actually have the concept, and it's a wrong concept, but we actually have the concept of being religious while being a terrible human being. Like, we've reconciled these two things. We can say, oh, he's very pious. He's just a really rude guy. He's very pious. He's just really rude. Oh, he's very knowledgeable. But he's kind of a jerk. It's okay, but he's still very knowledgeable. <laughs> it's like, it doesn't work that way. But we've somehow, unfortunately, we've, we've kind of, we view these two things to be coexistent. When Islam does not allow those two things to coexist. Our character is a representation of how much we know and how much we believe. That's, that's the bottom line. And then, in more enlightened circles, in more enlightened pockets of the, of the Ummah, we actually have the situation where, okay, I understand out in public, when I go out, when I go to work, when I'm in public, when I'm in the supermarket, when I even come to the masjid, I gotta be nice and smile and be pleasant and say salam and be very humble and forgiving, etc., etc. And at home, a complete tyrant. At home, just picking fights. At home, being miserable and terrible. And wretched and rude and mean. And we have to understand that the example of the Prophet is what? Khayrukum khayrukum li ahlihi wa ana khayrukum li ahlihi. The best amongst you is the one who is the best to his family, and I am the best to my family. So we gotta improve our character, we gotta improve our manners, and that begins at home with the family. And then the third part of the equation, which is somewhat related to the second part, and that is, we have to also understand. I'm gonna tell you something, like a human reality again. I have children, I have two daughters in Alhamdulillah. They are my whole world. They are the most, I mean, I don't love any two human beings as much as I love my daughters. They mean everything to me. At this point in time, because I have someone I care for so much, so deeply, if someone bought me a gift, if Zayd got me a nice gift, hint, hint, Right? That would be appreciated. Jazakallah khair, thank you very much. It's probably in your car, I'm assuming. Alright? Jazakallah khair, thank you very much. I'd be very grateful and appreciative. But if somebody got my daughters a gift, I, 
Yeah, I probably would get choked up. Just thinking about it chokes me up. I'd be so grateful, I'd be so touched, I, I, I wouldn't even know what to say. I'd be so grateful. It'd be such an unbelievable gesture. Like, wow, that's, that's amazing. I don't even know. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves His creation. He cares for His creation. He feeds and takes care of His creation. He maintains and sustains His creation. And when someone shows mercy, consideration, kindness to the creation of Allah, from an animal, to even a human being, that directly draws the mercy and the forgiveness from Allah's power. That person becomes the beloved of Allah by extending and showing love to the, to the beloved of Allah, the creation of Allah. So learn to serve the creation of Allah, beginning with people. Be at the service of people. Al-bir. Al-bir is the Quranic word for having a strong, firm-footed relationship with Allah. That's why ba refers to dry land. Bin is like when you have your feet on the dry land of Iman and Hubbullah. You have a strong, firm relationship with Allah that is al-bin. And when Allah talks about the concept of bin, He says it is to believe in Allah and the angels and the scriptures and the messengers and the prophets. And then it's to be good to your family. And then it's to take care of the orphans. And then it's to take care of the hungry and the needy. Then it's to help people earn their way out of slavery. Then it's, then it's to help somebody who's, who's, who's in a jam, who's in a tight spot. And then Allah says, it is to establish the prayer. Serving the creation of Allah is a powerful means of being the beloved of Allah and having the love of Allah. Especially when you go out of your way to help somebody who has no relationship to you, who is a total, complete stranger to you. When you show kindness to an animal, that you really have no other incentive and motive to show kindness to the animal other than the fact that it's the right thing to do. But why is it the right thing to do? You showed that animal kindness. You showed generosity to this human being that you have no relationship to. Why? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves this creation. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves this human being. Allah is merciful towards this human being. Allah has told me to show mercy, to show kindness to the creation of Allah. And that is what forces you, that is what pushes you, that is what motivates you. Then you continue to grow in your love for Allah and you also become the beloved of Allah. And that's the third part of the equation. The last thing that I wanted to talk about and emphasize here is gratitude. Iman is born out of gratitude. Obedience specifically. We said how obedience is a means of developing love for Allah, improving our love for Allah. Well, obedience comes from gratitude. We got to learn to be grateful to Allah. We got to learn to appreciate the blessings of Allah and express our gratitude to Allah. And the Prophet of Allah Wasallam said, مَنْ لَمْ يَشْكُ لِلنَّاسِ لَمْ يَشْكُ Somebody who is not grateful to people is not grateful to Allah. One other narration says, Man la yashkuru nas la yashkuru Allah. Or la yashkuru Allah man la yashkuru nas. That person will not be grateful to Allah who is not grateful to people. So developing, you know why? Ingratitude is a disease of the heart. Ingratitude is a disease of the heart. And you start off being, being ungrateful to maybe your friends and your family and the people that are close to you. You don't feel the need to thank them every single time. You don't feel the need to appreciate them all the time. Because, yeah, I mean, whatever. Like, eight years of marriage and I still gotta like notice every single time? I still gotta acknowledge every single time? Yes, you do. Because the ingratitude, it starts from there. And it's a disease, it will grow. Then you become ungrateful to other people. And eventually a day will come when you will be ungrateful to Allah. So you gotta cut that off. You gotta prevent that disease before it begins. By learning to be grateful and appreciative. In Allah, يُحِبُّ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves people who are shakur. In Allah, لَا يُحِبُّ كُلَّ مُخْتَارٍ فَخُورٍ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not love the person who is kafur. 
who is constantly ungrateful. But Allah loves those people who are constantly grateful. And so we have to learn to develop an attitude of gratitude. Trademark. Alright? We have to learn to develop an attitude of gratitude. And that begins now, that is not only with Allah, but also the people in our lives. One of, the, one of the things that I wanted to, you know, make everyone aware of and, and talk to everyone about today as well, that we had a topic and I wanted to address the topic. But one thing that I wanted to at least make everyone aware of is that in terms of, because we see here in this topic as well, so much of it relates back to our, us and our behavior in our personal relationships and how we manage them. That is a part of this conversation that it's important that we learn through the Qur'an and especially through the example of the Prophet ﷺ how to properly manage and maintain these personal relationships. And it's such a problem. And, and even if it's not a problem for someone, it's something that we have to continue to work and build on and get better and better at. Our role model, our standard is not us. You know, somebody probably says, oh, you know what, I'm good, I'm straight, I'm legit, I'm taking care of things, I'm handling things. I'm taking care of business, I'm handling things, I'm good. Our standard is Muhammad Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And as long as we're not at the level of Muhammad Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that just means we got more growing to do. We got more learning to do, we got more improvement to make. And that's a good thing. Continuing to get better and better and improve. So based off of that, there's a program that I conduct, a seminar, a workshop that I conduct, it's a one-day workshop that's called Happiness in the Home. It talks about these family relationships, how to better these relationships, how to improve these relationships, how to build on these relationships. And so alhamdulillah, um, I've taught it in quite a few places across the country in different locations. So inshallah, I'll be teaching it here in Houston at Masjid al-Salam, Champions Masjid, on Saturday, December 29th. Um, that's about six weeks away, six or seven weeks away. So I know it's a little bit of time away, but that gives everyone an opportunity to kind of circle that date, mark that, mark your calendar. And I really encourage everyone with their friends, with their families, get the word out. And everybody comes together at this program. So we sit together, learn together on how the Prophet ﷺ manages personal relationships. And we can learn from that, build on that, and improve on that, inshallah, be And I'll finally leave you with a little bit of you know, some motivational boost. There's a beautiful story that's one of my favorite stories that the Prophet ﷺ has actually told us. Um, Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah ta'ala mentions this story in his book, Kitab, Kit, Kitab Tawabi. People who constantly repent and turn back to Allah. He talks about stories of these people. And he mentions a story from the time of Musa alayhi salam. He says that at the time of Musa alayhi salam, there was a drought. Severe drought, severe famine. Terrible. People dying, hungry, thirsty, terrible conditions. So they, he made dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Oh Allah, alleviate our suffering. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told him that the way, the means that Allah gave him on how to alleviate some of that suffering, was gather all the people together, go outside of the town, outside of the city, into an open field, an open area, at a time, you know, during the morning time, like 10, 11 a.m., the sun is out, go stand under the sun, and go out there and pray. And he specifically told them, tell everyone, women, children, old, young, everybody, Go out there and make tawbah. Repent to Allah, ask Allah to forgive your sins, and that will attract and bring the mercy of Allah, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will alleviate your suffering. That was the instruction. We have a similar practice, it's called Salatul Istisqa, prayer for rain. And so, Musa alayhi gathers all of the Musa'i together. In the book he mentions, there's literally like tens and thousands of them. So imagine 70,000 believers. They go out there. And they stand out there. And they pray and they're crying and they're begging and they're pleading. 
You know how we make dua like in the, you know, the winter prayer in the month of Ramadan? In the last 10 nights, we just pour our hearts out. They're pouring their hearts out. Asking Allah for forgiveness, begging for forgiveness. And they beg and they beg and they cry and they cry and they plead. And nothing, no rain. And the people have been at it for a few hours. And they get tired, they get exhausted, and they say, Oh Musa, we did what you asked us to do. Musa Islam turns to Allah and says, Ya Allah, I brought them here. They begged and they cried and they pleaded and they begged you for forgiveness. They prayed to you, Ya Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells Musa alayhi salam, there's one person. There's only one person remaining from the entire group, tens of thousands of them. There's one person remaining who has not repented, who has not turned back. Who has not come back to me and reconnected with me. There's one person remaining. And because of that one person, Everybody's mercy is held up. Rain is held up from everyone. So Musa alayhi salam thinks to himself like, wow, this dude must really be messed up. Like this must be such a terrible dude, such a terrible person. He's done so many terrible things. And now on top of that, even now he doesn't repent. And nobody is getting rain because of that person. So Musa alayhi salam addresses the people and says, everybody, there's one person remaining who has not repented, has not turned back to a lie. Everybody is deprived because of that one person. Whoever that person was, hearing that announcement, thought to himself, man, I really miss it. And also thinks to himself like, I don't want to get called out. I don't want to make it obvious I was that one person. Because I'm already bad, now I feel bad about being bad. I'm regretful and remorseful for my behavior, for my stubbornness. And on top of that, I'm, I've been depriving everybody here. I don't want to deal with the judgment of all these people and the anger of all these people. So real quickly, making no sudden movement, no obvious gesture. That person in his heart says, Oh Allah, I messed up. I'm really sorry. I didn't realize the gravity of my actions. I messed up. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Please forgive me. And immediately, it started to pour. It started to pour. Now Musa alayhi salam just made this announcement and within seconds it started to pour. So he says, yeah, no, I, you just said rain was being held back because one person would not repent, one person would not turn back. And then all of a sudden it starts to pour down, it starts to rain. I don't understand. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told Musa alayhi salam that the same guy because of him, it was not raining before, everyone was deprived. This rain that I have sent down, I have sent down solely because of that person, because of the, how pleased I am that that one person turned back to me. That one person has become so beloved to me by turning back to me that now everybody is blessed because of the love that I have for that one person. Musa alayhi was blown away. He said, oh Allah, that's unbelievable. That's remarkable. You gotta tell me who that person is. I mean, that's an unbelievable story. That's the most amazing thing I've ever heard. Yeah, Allah, you have to tell me who that person is. I have to know who that person is. I have to see that person. I have to shake their hand. I have to meet that person. Because that is amazing. To go from that end to this end. And here comes the most amazing part of the story. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told Musa alayhi salam, He said, Oh Musa, when that guy was sinful, when that guy was still stubborn and would not turn back to me, would not even repent to me when he was being told to repent to me, 
I did not disclose his identity and humiliate or embarrass him. Now that he has come back to me, now that he has become my beloved, why do you think I would disclose his identity now and humiliate and embarrass him about his past now? Now he's my beloved. Now it's impossible. I will never tell you who he is. That's between me and between him. That is Allah. And that is the love of Allah. And that's what we're striving for. That's what we're working towards. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all the love of Allah. Ameen. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us all the beloved of Allah. Ameen. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the ability to make Allah our number one priority in our lives. Ameen. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the character and the mannerisms and the behavior of the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the love of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us from the beloved of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam on the day of judgment. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to live our lives based on these values, grant us success in this life and in the hereafter, and the eternal uh, success and the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Jazakumullah mm-hmm. um, khairan. I really wanted to appreciate everyone for coming out and um, you know, uh, attending the program and listening. And again, uh, please remember the program. It's on December 29th. It's a Saturday at Champions Masjid. Uh, I'll look forward to seeing everyone there. There are flyers. You can grab a flyer on the way out and spread the word to others as well, inshallah. Thank you.